Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucy Pixel and welcome back. Now, today's video, I actually had recorded, edited, and uploaded last week. And it was scheduled to be uploaded last Monday. But a few hours before uploading it, I decided to listen to it one last time. And <clears throat> I realized that I felt it was coming across too much like a rant, like a complaint, which was merited, in my opinion. But that's not the tone I really wanted to convey. I didn't want this to come across as being me complaining for the sake of complaining. I wanted to offer something constructive to the conversation and offer some feedback on the conversation and not take an overly frustrated tone. Although I'm very frustrated about this topic and that's the whole reason why I why I decided it was an important topic to talk, talk about. And that, if you can read titles, is my feelings and my opinions about, um, in large part, not entirely, but in large part, the traditional educational system as it exists today. And by that, I don't mean everywhere, because as we know, depending on where you live, the cost and the quality of education, of public education, varies quite a bit. I know that the cost of education here in Canada is hugely subsidized compared to other countries. So therein lies one major difference. Well, with that being said, I am a teacher. I teach in the school system, or at least I'm still a registered teacher in the school system, although I've been running my mentorship now full time for a couple of years. Uh, at least two, since 2015, and um, I am a supporter of the educational system. But being a supporter does not mean I'm a blind supporter of the educational system, because there are so many things about it that, in my very strong and very public opinion, is ass backwards. I think that if if the the educational system the traditional educational system as it exists today in many, many places, Canada included, put a little bit of thought into it. Huge systemic changes would need to be put in place. So at the forefront of this is a realization when you take a more parental role in this system. Furthermore, not only a parental role, but a 43-year-old teacher parent perspective of this. Somebody who's made a living out of teaching, somebody who is a passionate and loving member of this community of teachers. And that is the fact that we need to redefine, we need to, we need students, you, if you're a student applying or are currently enrolled in college or university, Oh yeah, and something to something to clarify is that we're talking about professional education, not high school, but post high school education. Um, remember that this is a service that you paid for. Think about that for a second. You've paid for the service. If you ever walked into a restaurant and you ordered something and the waiter was rude with you and didn't bring you what you asked for, or brought you half of what you asked for, but not the complete order and treated you like crap and demoralized you and, and humiliated you, would you ever go back to that restaurant again? Well, of course not. You're paying for a service. And if that service is not fulfilled in a professional and friendly manner, then you just won't give them your business anymore. Yet, when it comes to the educational system, regardless of whatever amazing price you might be having to pay at this point in your life when you don't necessarily or usually don't have the income to be able to afford it, which is where loans and bursaries and debt comes in, you're basically stuck with what you got. If your teacher is incompetent, if your teacher is unprofessional, if your teacher demoralizes or humiliates students, then well, you're stuck with that. If you're lucky, you might be able to change the class, but the school is limited with the number of teachers they have. 
And there's a very good chance you're going to have to put up with it for months. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I know personally people close to me who are enrolled in this educational system, pursuing a professional artistic career and a professional artistic um, uh, training in school and is faced with, and this isn't my judgmental perspective, absolutely incompetent teachers. These are hired professionals and they are completely incompetent, not only in their abilities, but in their execution of their job, which is to teach. I'm a teacher. Remember this. I'm a teacher. I've, I've seen many teachers. I come from a family of teachers. And when I see teachers that insult, humiliate publicly in front of the whole class, that make students feel stupid or embarrassed for, for asking questions, that to me is a telltale sign of an incompetent teacher. And the reason I'm saying that is because if you know something, just think about it, if somebody approaches you with a topic that you are well-versed in, something that you're well-trained in, and they ask you a question and you have the answer to that question, would it not be your default response to say, sure, yeah, let me show you, and want to show off and want to pass your fancy knowledge down to somebody else, right? You, I know something you could really benefit from. Here, let me show you what I know and make you think I'm really smart and awesome, right? That would be the default thing you'd want to do if somebody came to you asking for help on a topic that you were qualified for. But from multiple sources, and I'm not naming names just to protect the, you know, protect the privacy of the those who have divulged their their situations to me, Re, like recently within all within the last few months, numerous situations from multiple different countries, from multiple different people. The teacher would respond, basically telling them, if you don't put in the work, you're not going to get the results. When the student had come to them and asked, what do I need to improve this work? Or if another student walked up, walked up to him and said, in this one particular case, had walked up to him and said, uh, what should, what do I need to do to improve this piece? The teacher would take their painting, place it on the floor, and then grab the paintings of about five or six other students from the class, put them in the floor next to them and point to it and say, why is that the worst one in the class? In a gesture to humiliate. Or if a, if a teacher, or if the, or if a teacher would say something along the lines of, you know, you really need to get better at blah, 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 at this and this or that. And the student said, well, how should I do that? asking for something of substance apart from just an insult or a criticism. He would look up and say, I'm the teacher. Mind your own damn business. I'll let you know when I have advice to give you. That to me is a way of defending your own incompetence, isn't it? It's the way of, def if inst you know that if you get cornered with questions you aren't qualified to answer, instead of admitting to this because you're an asshole, you will instead humiliate the student. And make them feel stupid. Point, make them feel bad so that they don't ask questions. And also deter anybody else from the class from asking questions. Because because you know that if, the, if you are cornered to answer the question, your incompetence will be unveiled. This situation is so amazingly common. Uh, when I was in school, I had a teacher who said, Listen, I don't give a shit if you do any work. You all got A's. Whatever. Just show up for class. You've passed. I've got other teachers that would that gave people poor professional advice in hindsight i realize it was very poor professional advice or other teachers that didn't give them anything of value we're talking years of your life up to half a decade if not more of education usually three to four years if you can squeeze it in in that tight a time frame and they walk away with nothing of value and very negative experiences. Some good, some bad, hit or miss, shot in the dark. Are these statistics? Are these, is this, does this statistic impress you when this is a product you've paid for? You're, remember that if you're a student or you're a parent, you are feeding this economy. You, by giving you their money, you are agreeing to these terms, right? 
But because education is something that's instilled in you at such a young age, you're, you're born into it practically, you know, kindergarten, then you're into the grade system, and then you're to the high school, and then from high school, depending on where you are, there's middle school, things like that, and then there's college and university and so on and so forth. It's so systemic. It's so ritualistic for you to get up every day and go to school every day for a huge portion of the first, you know, up 20 to 25 years of your life that you never sit back and say, would I voluntarily pay for a service like this if I had a choice? Sometimes, yeah, absolutely. Other times the answer is, I'd be an idiot to give my money to people under those circumstances, wouldn't you? Yet we do, we repeatedly do. We keep feeding this system of incompetent teachers, of incompetent schools. And some people are paying through their teeth for this. Some people are putting themselves in a lifetime of debt for this shit service. And you got to sit back and ask yourself the question, do I want to continue doing this under these circumstances? But we're so conditioned to say, you need education. You can't survive without education. You can't move forward without education. We, you know, edu knowledge is, is power. Knowledge is freedom. It is. But is that kind of education the only source of education you can get this kind of training from? Do you have to pay this much? And do you have to deal with such incompetence? Does do you is it fair for you to have to pay for a service and take your chances like a bingo game and try to figure out whether or not this is a good school whether or not these teachers are qualified i don't think so so that's the strike one to me that's the first big strike one when it comes to the educational system a lack of skilled teachers <clears throat> and usually if you are if you do have a skilled teacher it's for one of those high-end exclusive schools that you have to pay a ton, private schools or schools, you know, the more expensive ones, the exclusive ones, like CalArts or something like that, right? So that's the big strike one. The big strike two is how little school, the school system, I'd say almost globally, but again, like I said, there's a lot, there are many more progressive, forward-thinking countries out there that put a lot more thought into the design and the structure of their school system. But North America, which is a very big part of the population and across Europe, in many parts across Europe, the structure of school is probably the least conducive environment for learning and growth and positivity and it starts with the very structure of it how these classes how these schedules are put together if you're a parent if you are uh, um, if you're a student if you're somebody between the ages of let's say 15 and 25 roughly let's say I'll go I'll, I'll, I'll I'll go with a very wide, broad age range, but somewhere within that area, teenagers to people in their early 20s, generally. It is a biological fact that your circadian rhythm is offset due to the extremely fast growth of your body and mind. And if you don't know anything about the circadian rhythm, it's, the, it's your hormonal rhythm related to your awake and sleeping times during the day your body cre produces a hormone called melatonin at night to make you drowsy and usually kicks in a little bit before you before your usual scheduled bedtime you start to get sleepy and you fall asleep and then as the morning as the night goes on your melatonin drops and then slowly your cortisol your wake up hormone kicks in and when your when your cortisol kicks in you wake up and in somebody within that age range, that melatonin doesn't start kicking in until late, much later on. A young child, the melatonin might start kicking in around, around seven, eight, nine o'clock, depending on their sleep, sleep schedule, because it does adjust based on your sleep schedule. Whereas for somebody in their teens or early 20s, your, your, your melatonin doesn't kick in later, 11, 12 o'clock. That's why very often if you have any teenage kids, they're up all night. They're up till 12, 1 o'clock, sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning. And that might seem extremely late 
and irresponsible from your children, but that's when their that's when their productivity time comes in because everybody else has gone to bed, everybody else has fallen asleep, and that's when their mind is both active and quiet because they don't have the distractions of the house. So that's when they're usually up, being productive, texting their friends, doing shit, and then probably around 12, 1, maybe 2 o'clock in the morning, they fall asleep. This is a biological fact for pretty much every, every person at that age group across the planet. This is biological. This isn't something they chose yet. The educational system has them working incredibly ridiculous hours, the hours that prevent them from respecting their own natural sleep schedule. Because it's also a known scientific fact that teenagers and early people in their early 20s need a minimum, a minimum of eight hours of sleep. And that's a barely passing grade in terms of sleep. They should ideally be getting over 10 hours of sleep. But their biological clock keeps the, their biological hormonal clock keeps them up until around 12, one o'clock in the morning. And then they've got to get up at 536 in the morning to go to school. So we're talking about an entire society of people at a certain age group that are frighteningly sleep deprived. And if you've made, if you've ever read any research on the correlation between sleep and mental and physical health, then you know that this is very damaging. So that's where you, that's why cafes, that's why they're, that's why cafes and coffee shops do so extremely well when they set them up near colleges and universities because beverages full of caffeine and sugar, heavy stimulating drinks are basically what they need just to be minimally functional in school. And when you keep piling that on, on top of them, that sleep, when that sleep deprivation starts to accumulate and accumulate over months and months and months, you've got yourself a serious problem. Depression, memory loss, la loss of confidence, uh, you name it. It's just the, 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 and physical health issues that come along with this. These students, should be getting an average of 10 hours of sleep a night where they could be their most productive and learn their fastest and grow their fastest and, and have the best memories and be the most productive and be the most upbeat and sociable. And you're depriving them to averages of three to five to six hours of sleep a night if they're lucky. That, to me, doesn't work. Yep. Keep on keeping on. System's been doing this for the last hundred years. Got to keep on doing it. Can't change nothing. Got to keep doing it the way it's always been done. And generation after generation of dropouts and depression and mental illness and all of these different things keep getting bigger and badder every day. And it's reaching a point right now where it's a freaking epidemic. It's an epidemic of exhaustion. It's an epidemic of depression and, you know, depression, medication and failing endocrine systems and hormonal systems, you name it. It affects every single part of your life, physically and emotionally. And then you add something else to this. And this is a big one. This is one of the main reasons I wanted to jump into this topic. The workload. I don't know if this is a school system issue or if this is a individual teacher issue it's a, if, or if it's an overall communication issue. I think it's systemic. I think it's every, all of the above. The workload that these students are having dumped on their laps. I don't care if you're young and full of piss and vinegar. I don't care how much energy you've got. But the workload that is slammed on the shoulders of these students is absolutely counterproductive. It is stressful, it is overwhelming, and it's one of the main things not only contributing to the sleep deprivation issue, but it's contributing to the incredibly high level of stress that they have to deal with on top of it. If you are, I, I was approached by somebody recently who was probably one of the most optimistic lighthearted, ambitious, self-motivated artists I've ever met. 
And I mean, she's never needed a push from anybody. She's always been able to do it. In fact, she's the one who's very often helped other people in her class push themselves. And she got in touch with me recently in tears. And it really shocked me because this person is not the type of person who, who, who loses it that overtly. She's somebody who's generally has a pretty, you know, solid stoic exterior. And she called me crying because she was completely overwhelmed with the thought that she'd have to extend her education, her college education in an extra year to make it four years instead of three. And I could tell that she was exhausted. I could tell that she was overwhelmed. I could hear it in her voice. She had like raspy, scratchy voice. I could tell she'd been crying for some time. And I could hear in her voice just how incredibly stressed she was over the subject. And I told her quite simply, I said, what's the failure? What's the fear of going an extra year? If you, you're talking to a 43 year old man, one year, one year adding a year to your education is literally a drop in the bucket. It'll, it'll, it'll pass by so quickly you won't even notice it. But she said, you don't understand. There's more to it than just extending my education an extra year. It's the fact that what few friends I have left from last year, I'm going to be leaving behind. She basically had spent the first year of her education making all of these friends, these connections, these very strong bonds. And she'd be leaving all of these people behind because she felt the need to extend it. Now, strong bonds with the people who were left, because that's the next topic I'm going to talk about. What few friends she had left, she'd be leaving behind. And I can't stress enough the importance of friendship. It is the bread and butter. It is the, it is the glue that holds people together. When you don't have your family to turn to, you have your friends to turn to, people, your kindred spirits, people who live the same life you do, people who listen to the same music and share the same passions and have the same schedule that you do. I can't stress, the, I can't stress enough the importance of, of people making friends and making these connections, these bonds. It's what pulls you through some of the hardest times in your life. And when that support group, that when that emotional support group you have is forced to drop out or you're forced to leave them because the workload is so overwhelming to, I add, one of the most ambitious students of her year, that's a problem, isn't it? And I said, well, maybe you'll be lucky and some of your friends will will extend their their education as well and they'll end up meeting you somewhere down the line. Well, it hasn't happened yet. And she's been forced to kind of walk into a new group of strangers and try to make friends with them. But by now, she's starting to realize the last problem on this list, at least for today. And that is that this workload, this intense workload, isn't only burning people out, but it's forcing it's forcing an incredibly unimpressive dropout rate to occur. And this is nothing new. When I was in school, when I, when I was studying in college university, I remember the first year there'd be 75 of us. By year two, 30 of us. By year three, eight. I mean, the dropout rate was absolutely amazing. You started off in a class full of people and there was a lot of noise and stuff going on. By the time you were graduating, you were alone completely utterly alone and this is happening with this student as well she's had a bunch of friends 85 percent of those friends didn't make it into year two not because they sucked not because they didn't have talent because they couldn't handle it it was too much it was overwhelming them and she gets into year two uh, two of the friends that she's got left she actually helped to get into year two and they're probably not going to make it to year three. But then she has to leave them because she needs to extend her education and stretch out this loneliness an extra year with. And when it comes crunch time, when the when the finals are coming and they have big assignments they've got to get completed at the end of the year, and she's up until 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning pulling these all-nighters at school, she's doing so alone in a school or in a room with a bunch of strangers. That sucks. 
that's no way to that's no way to to experience the quote happiest years of your life yeah my ass that's not happy that's lonely that's depressing and you got to ask yourself a question from a guy who's a father from somebody who's a teacher both a private teacher i, I run my own mentorship and a teacher in the school system and a professional and a health advocate and all of the above and from a businessman i might add what's the what's the advantage to whose advantage is it if you really think about it objectively to whose advantage is it for the school system to continue on this path of exhausting burning out depressing students into dropout into depression I'm not saying all the time, but in these very frequent cases and subjecting paying students to subpar and very often even abusive teaching practices. And it's still, you know, when I was in school, we're going back to over 20 years ago and it's still going on 20 years later. To whose benefit is it for what has it been and to who's benefiting from this to, to think that this is the way to keep going, moving forward and to have not made any changes in decades, at least the decades that I've been aware of it. To whose benefit is this? What in this structure is functional and sustainable? Well, follow the money trail. That's what they say. Follow the money trail economically. They're pumping in as many students into that year one as possible. They don't give a shit who makes it into year two. They really don't give a crap who makes it into year two. Because as long as they, they break budget with those early entry admissions and their school fees, their bills are paid. They've, they've made their budget. So whoever makes it into year two and year three is, is extra change in their pockets. That's just one theory, right? I'm not an economist. I don't, I, don't, I don't do the books at the school. But there's one theory. The second theory is, and this is my stronger opinion, is that the educational system has reached a point of complacency. They've, it, this tradition, this ritual, this necessity, this social conditioning to go to school, go to school, Finish your education, become a professional, pursue your quote passion, like anybody knows what the hell their passion is at that point in their life, right? But for those who do, go to school, go to school, go to school, this conditioning to go every single day. People are, have, been, have been so conditioned to continue this pattern that they've been able to survive off of the pattern, the ritual itself. It's, it's an industrial attitude. As long as that machine keeps whirring, they're going to keep on they're going to keep on fueling it. And when the machine dies, well, then we'll do something about it. Well, the machine hasn't died yet. And in my personal opinion, the way the machine exists right now socially, the way this machine works for the benefit or not benefit of students needs to break this structure is no longer viable economically or personally it's designed around in my opinion what it, what it, what really looks to be the industrialization of of the educational system rather than the betterment of the individual which is the whole premise that it was built on, isn't it? To give people the freedom of education, the, the, to empower people with an education they need to be able to make a living for themselves as individuals and gain financial and personal freedoms. That's the whole reason why it exists in the first place, to feed the economy. And they're not doing that. They're burning these kids out. They're demotivating them. They are not respecting 
their lifestyle. They're not respecting the workload, a healthy workload. Like, think about it. If I was slamming somebody with 60 plus hours of work every single week and sleep depriving them, what exactly am I conditioning them for? What type of quote industry am I preparing these future artists for? I'm essentially preparing them to get conditioned to burn themselves out. I am literally trying to burn as much productivity out of them that I can at an early phase so that I can get the most money out of them early in the early in in their life when they've still got the most energy and when they burn out and they end up having to put the, all of that money into the medical system which is also feeding the economy I might add we're just going to replace them with the next batch of students people just keep having sex don't they people just keep having babies that 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 resource just keeps getting bigger and bigger as the population grows this industry is is to me reflecting the industrialization of people exploiting a resource i.e your kids or yourself you're being exploited what I feel needs to happen, my uh, going back and l listening to last week's video and re-recording it, I thought about it all week long. I thought to myself, what could we do to change this? Well, I think that these changes are already happening in small doses in a private level. Well, for artists, at least, we have these art mentorships, my own included, that are popping up all over the place, that don't require students to sleep two hours a night, that don't burn students out and are offering them pretty much the same quality education what i can't unfortunately offer students is the social aspect of it i'm not i, I don't run a classroom it's private it's one-on-one -on -one. i'm giving them the artistic education of it but not the social education so in that regard my mentorship any online mentorship has that limitation i could teach classes but i prefer teaching individuals one-on-one -on -one. that's my personal preference that's my style that's my belief, but it's definitely a much healthier learning environment. I also know that there's a thing called forums out there. And I stand behind what I do as all of my peers like Anthony Jones and Tyler Edlin and Noah Bradley and Bobby Chu and Chris Oatley and all of these different online teachers, Clint Kearley, all of these online teachers stand behind their teachings. If they suck at their job, then that will be posted in a forum. The people will bitch and complain about their education and their business will fail. There's a direct, you can go just like an Amazon review and go online and read up on your educator. What do they teach? How do they teach it? What's their approach? How competent are they? How knowledgeable are they on the topics that they teach? And you can get a full synopsis and review of the personality and the competence of your teacher. Why the hell can't you do that in the school system? Why, why are we paying them money and, we, and they keep the competence of their teachers hidden behind closed doors? And it's not until you walk into that classroom that you realize that your teacher's an asshole, an incompetent asshole. How is that fair? So what I think is actually happening is what needs to be happening. My real honest belief on what's going to change the system is to force the educational, educational system on the brink by not paying them anymore. It's not until we stop supporting them and realize that they are our paid service. We hired them. We paid for them to offer us a service. If we stop giving them our, our business, they'll be forced to change. And if they don't change, they will die. Period. End of story. We could try picketing outside the school and say, this sucks. We don't like it. They're not going to change anything if there's no economical impact. If money keeps coming in, they're going to keep doing things business as usual. It's been going on like this for so long, I don't think they'd be capable of changing. They're too set in their ways. You need to make them starve a little bit. You need to make them panic. You need to put a little bit of stress in them. 
Start respecting our sleep schedules. Stop giving us 60 plus hours of, of work to do each week. We have jobs we need, to, we need to do in order to pay our bills. So stop doing this to us. We also want to make sure if I have a teacher that sucks, I want to be able to drop him and have a whole list of other teachers I can pick from that year to be able to supplement it. If you think about it in the school system, it's so set in its, way, in its ways that it's hard to imagine any school system doing that. Do they have access to that many teachers? No, they don't have access to that many teachers. Hence the reason why they very often <laughs> have such incompetent teachers. Hey, government, if you try teach, paying your teachers a proper salary, maybe that'll give you a little bit more power, and power to govern their quality. Don't you think? And that's my solution number two. And this again is an economical one. This, this is, it's, it's a money issue. Always follow the money. I learned something being a director at, at a big studio, a very well-known studio. I'm not going to name which one, but I was working at a really well-known studio and I learned a very valuable lesson about money and power. And what that lesson was, was when you don't pay people, you, can, you're not, you, you can't afford to complain. When you don't pay your artists, what I was experiencing in this studio, when I walked in there, uh, the first thing I realized when I actually did the math was these artists are being completely exploited. They're not, they're, the salary is, is barely enough for them to make ends meet. And they were working for a big studio, big name projects that was raking in millions and millions of dollars. And these individual artists, the ones actually producing the show, were getting paid peanuts. They were paying, getting paid a very, very crappy commission on a very large volume of work. And I walked in there being their supervisor. And I started doing my job and my job was to, of course, being a supervisor, I'm quality control and I'm making sure it lives up to a certain standard, up to the standard of this particular studio. And um, I saw that there was an issue with the salary and um, I brought this up with my boss and my boss said, oh, it's, it is what it is. How much we can do about that? And I went, uh-huh, okay. And then artists started submitting their work. So what did I do? I did my job. I looked at it. I compared it to the style guide that we needed to be following. And I said, okay, you need to improve this and this and that. And when I did, my artists, who I was hired to manage, went behind my back to my boss and said, this Adam guy has a lot of freaking nerve. And my boss said, what do you mean? Well, he's telling me I need to fix this. And what did my boss do? Did my boss turn to the artist and say, well, that's what he's hired to do, to fix your artwork. No, he came to me and said, Adam, you might want to take it easy on the artists. And I went, what do you mean take it easy? I'm not being hard on them. I'm just, we do have a style guide that I'm doing my job. He goes, ah, you know what? Can't really afford to push him too much. If there's, a, if there's something that needs to be fixed, just do it yourself. And I said, well, I can't supervise and, uh, and, 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 produce their artwork and correct all of their artwork they're hired because they should be able should be competent enough to do this themselves that's what they've been hired to do uh you know what i wouldn't i wouldn't push it adam and i'm like well that doesn't make a damn bit of sense so what, what are, my boss said what he said but i'm sitting there going well then you then i'm gonna need a salary increase if that's the case because now i'm doubling up my work right and for a couple of months I barely managed to, but I just couldn't keep up with it. And before you knew it, my workload was through the sky, through the, it was through the roof. I could not, of course, who could manage that? Who could manage, you know, supervising the work of, of over 17 artists, getting constant emails and meetings all the time. And then on top of it, having to polish up everybody's artwork it didn't make any damn sense, did it? And I said to my boss at that point, I walk into my boss's office at a certain point and I was, I was kind of at a breaking point. I was kind of like, your answer is going to determine my attitude towards my work from this point forward. And I said, why don't you take my salary, my unreasonably high salary from what I'm doing and give half of it to my, or spread it out amongst my artists. I literally asked him this and he said, why would you want me to, he smirked. He thought I was being stupid. And I said, no, I'm not trolling you. I'm being freaking serious. Give half of my salary to my students. I don't, I don't need more than that to pay my bills and to have a little bit of extra pocket change. Why don't you give that to my artists? And he said, why the hell would you want me to do that? I said, because then I would actually have the power to manage them. When you cheap out on your artists, you're exploiting them. And if you're exploiting them, then what you, you get what you get and you don't get upset as the expression goes. 
If you give them money, I will have the power to be able to say, please fix that yourself. I won't have to do that work for them. But you're, you're, you're teaching your artist to have a really shitty attitude about management and you're making my job impossible and burning me out. When you're paying, you're paying the money to me, give it to them instead. You can't correct a system that is already being exploited. You need to pay them first. But of course they didn't. And I was the one to get let go. Right? But that would have been the smart thing to do. Pay your artists. They're the ones building your game. If you have a competent supervisor who walks in and wants to correct it, he'll tell them to correct it and they will because they value their job and they've got a really good paying job. They don't want to lose it. Look what happened with Magic the Gathering versus, for instance, Fantasy Flight Games or any of these other card games that haven't caught up with them yet. When Art Pact, very sadly not around anymore, but when Art Pact made a public stink along with a lot of these magic artists that they that artists weren't getting paid enough to produce the to, to produce the beautiful artwork they make for magic the gathering and for fantasy flight and for all these other trading card games magic in particular being the most popular one buckled under the pressure and substantially increased the payout per card that these artists made enough for them to make a very healthy living from which they freaking deserve because we're talking about top end artists as such, that gave Magic the Gathering the, 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 the power to be able to hire the best talent and to demand the best results. And artists would bend over backwards to produce their best work because they were getting paid and recognized for that work and they were making a good living from that work that they were producing. But if you look at a company like Fantasy Flight or any of these other companies that are paying less than a third to a quarter of what magic is now after that salary change after that out of that payout change you get what you get and if you turn to an artist and you tell them that they need to if they, they need to start over and fix it because it doesn't live up to the company standards you know what they do they laugh in your face and say all right good luck finding another artist that can replace me good luck finding another professional artist who's willing to work for that money have fun and you know what's happened they are their resources are running out real fast and they deserve it because it's too goddamn cheap to pay their artists. Period. Now, of course, the artists agree to that before they start the job, but as soon as a bigger, better thing comes, they're out the door. So that leaves that leaves these 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 companies that don't pay their artists in a very precarious situation, in a, in a state of panic. So what happens? They can't afford to pay their directors anymore because their artists are leaving them. And then they end up, the, the directors end up leaving and they reply, replace them with incompetent skill too. They'll, they'll take anybody off the street at that point. And of course, we know that any system working like that would not work. Well, how does that relate to the educational system? Pay your damn teachers. Pay your goddamn teachers. When you pay your teachers, when they get a good salary, which they freaking should, but worldwide, the epidemic, the epidemic of poorly paid teachers is never been corrected and is preposterous. Pay te these teachers are literally the, some of the most skilled professionals, some of the most professional skill that are training the future artists that are feeding this economy. Wouldn't it make sense to pay them proper salaries? But they don't. So what happens is these teachers end up finding better things. And they end up having to replace these teachers with incompetent pricks that can't answer simple questions without humiliating them. It's a trickle down effect. You don't pay them proper money. You get incompetent teachers. You get incompetent teachers. You have dropout students. You have dropout students. You lose money. You lose money. You can't afford to hire better help. So you'll take whatever Joe Schmo you can get off the street who you can pay a shitty salary to. If you're lucky, you might find somebody's good, but you can never rely on them sticking around. So there's no sustainability. There's no reliability to these teachers because they'll be here one day out the next. And the cycle lives on. If you take that money and you give it to teachers, you get great talent. You get students who walk out of there feeling fulfilled. You get teachers who feel fulfilled, who dedicate themselves to the job. If they step out of line, their job gets threatened because they're not living up to the standard that their clients, AKA students, are paying for. And the bad teachers get weaned out and the good teachers replace them and everybody lives happily ever after, right? 
but they don't. So to that I say, vote with your wallet. There are many alternatives out there right now, many alternatives out there that are far more affordable, far more sustainable, and you won't have to, you'll be able to pick and choose the educator that best suits you based on your style and based on the online reviews. And if that teacher happens to suck, you write a bad review, you stop giving him your money and you go find somebody else. Job done. I know this still sounds like a bit of a rant, and I know I'm not coming in saying, here's a step-by-step -step guide, but honest to God, this industry means the world to me. Teaching means the world to me. I want to see the, the future betterment of the art world. And I am personally very, very upset to see how many depressed, sleep-deprived, broke teachers and students are out there. The system needs to change. And if it requires it to be threatened into extinction, so be it. All right. So <laughs> next week, I promise we'll have a more, we'll, we'll, our, our, our talk will have a little bit more of a positive note, but I really want this message to get out there. I really want to see things change moving forward. And I want, I want you guys to, if you have a voice, I want you to share it. I want you, if you have experience, your own personal experiences, I want you to have the courage to share this online. Spread the word. Share this video if you want the, the word to get around. Um, and, and make a point of making this more of a public conversation. So we don't kind of sit around and hum and haw and complain in the back, in the back alley. We actually step out on the curb and start saying something publicly about it. And in time, if we add enough of these voices together, change will start to happen. All right. So with that said, I love you all with all my heart, as always, of course, and happy painting. Take care. Thank you.